Kano State Government has reduced the salaries of political office holders in the state by 50% for the month of March due to diminishing resources. Now, the State Commissioner for Information, Mala Mohamed Garva, said the decision affected the governor, the deputy governor, and all public holders in the state that included all commissioners, special advisors, and assistants, among others. At the local level, he said, the slash affected the chairman, vice chairman, elected councillors, advisors, and secretaries of local governments. Well, joining us to discuss this is Shegun Shopitan, a good governance advocate, and Olua Dari Kolawole, deputy director of the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, Serap. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, I'm going to start with you, um, Kala Wale, because um, Serap is one of those um, agencies that are always on the case of governments all across the Federation. And I'm sure that you have a million plus suits against different governments across the Federation. Sometimes I wonder how you do it. But um, the question which is reoccurring in the minds of people is slashing these salaries, how does it affect the cost of governance? Uh, does it even begin to scratch the surface? Uh, thank you very much. I would like to react firstly by saying that this is the right step in the right direction. Um, we, we can applaud the canopy government for doing this, but it is just not enough, given how far we sunk in uh, the wasteful, wasteful spending of public resources. Uh, and again, it's very important to point out, I've not had time to dig further into this news, but it's good to ask the kind of thing government, uh, are we talking of salaries only or allowances or other parts of office? It is very important that we clarify that. And be that that it may, um, more needs to be done in that regard. If what we're talking about is just salary, what about pension? I know for a fact that Kano State is one of those states out of the 20 states or so in Nigeria that have pension laws. And we're in court also against the Kano State government. Uh, the suit that is at the federal court, I do that. They're asking the Kano State government, uh, uh, along with other 35 states, to disclose the details of their pension laws and who has earned what under those uh, pension laws. So while we might applaud the Kano State government for doing this, matching salaries that would appear to cut across board, in Kano State. Uh, the, the pension for governors and former governors, I believe, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, still, uh, still remains. And so we can say that this move, while it is beneficial and positive, is yet to scratch the surface of, uh, of stemming the tide of uh, wasteful spending and the huge cost of government, which is just not sustainable, not at all. Okay. Shagun, um Let's talk about the economic implications of this. And now he, um, Kola Wale has said that it's not sustainable per se. Uh, for a long time, people have called on the National Assembly, members of the National Assembly, to cut the cost of the, their running costs and you know their allowances and all of the ridiculousness that we see in the list of things that make up what they receive at the end of the day as a pa pay package. Um, if just cutting salaries is not enough, what next can be done, especially when we are trying to mop up all resources across the states uh, to make sure that we can actually manage the economy and uh, be able to at least fund the budget? You know, talking about um, these types of issues sometimes um, gets a bit frustrating because you keep, we've been saying the same thing for decades, <laughs> practically, you know. You know, practically, we've been saying it for years and years, and now it's rolling into decades. Um, the cost of governance, when, when politicians do these types of things, I, I, I think, you know, Kola only said, well, maybe they should be commended. I agree, because, yeah, it's a step in, in the right direction. But this is tokenism um, taken to the point of insult, uh, because we all know that uh, the remuneration that these guys will receive, their salaries, uh, and I have checked the story. It's talking primarily about salaries and allowances. So, um, the, the, you know, I mean, the official salaries. So all the other things that we know that they get is not affected. You know, so so this is this is a joke. If if we to answer your question, what needs to be done? 
you know, a state that budgets about 280 billion naira for a year, right? So that's roughly um, in the region of uh, 22, 23 billion uh, naira per, per month as their overall budget, you know, um, has no business doing a lot of the things that they're doing. They simply don't have enough money to invest in developmental activities. So if the Kano State government is serious about saying they want to cost, cut the cost of governance, the first thing to do is to cut down on political appointments and offices. You know, um, this retinue of aides and assistants, you have special advisors, you have special assistants, you have senior special assistants, all of them on salary. Hmm. What are these guys doing? I know that some of these guys actually do have some work to do, but a, a huge chunk of them are just there to, to, to it's job for the boys, it's political settlement. Exactly. I mean, one of the states where it's reputed. I'm sorry, um, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry yeah, to speak over you, but I, I just want to ask for a, a, a case in point. Uh, the Kosovo state government does have, uh, uh, you know, a long exactly. list of aids, and I don't know for exactly. other states, but uh, and and I mean exactly. a massive list of aids, and 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 the governor calls it some form of uh, what's it called? He calls it an empowerment. Now, it's is ridiculous. It, if we cannot cut the allowances, I mean, cutting allowances, like we have said, is applaudable, but. What about the number of people that are in those governments that sometimes don't even have offices to sit in? Now, we also have duplication of ministries, departments, and agencies all in that same government with bloated budgets. Shouldn't we, the people, I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I'm just going to take a leap here. Shouldn't we, the people, be advocating for those kinds of things to be totally, um, you know, taken out? In, uh, I mean, this is for people that I think are aware of what's going on in government, because these things are also maybe bleeding us, you know, bleeding us as a, as a country or as, as a state. I mean, absolutely. You know, it, it should go without saying that, you know, we as a people um, need to rise up against these things, need to take these guys to task and compel them to do the right thing. We all know the right thing. They know the right thing. Um, this is just, you know, for them, they don't care. Because they don't, you know, as far as they're concerned, and, you know, these types of conversations will go round in circles and it's a catch-22 because um, at the end of the day, you, you have to talk about the election cycles and our political uh, leadership selection system and all of that. They know that they really, really, really genuinely don't need us per se. All they need is 2,000 Naira or 3,000 Naira to buy votes and they're in. So when we pressure them to say, look, cut your aid, cut the perks of office, Cut the allowances, the foreign travel. Uh, the, 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 when you talk about salaries and you also talk about overhead, it's ridiculously large. We're talking 60 to 70 percent of the average state budget and the federal budget as well. It's ridiculous. But what can we do about it? Because at the end of the day, an organization like Sarah, who everybody respects for all the work that they do, will sue them. Uh, quite a number of um, other organizations, private individuals have different cases in court, and these guys just ignore these things, you know? So, so you begin to wonder, um, at some point, something will have to give. <laughs> it's not sustainable. The money that should be spent on developing lives, on looking into human development indicators and improving on them, is being eaten, practically, you know, like almost physically, you take a fork and knife and cut this money and eat it up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. Okay. So, you know. Kalawale, um, back to you. Some states might be so indebted that the children's children's children would also be indebted. It's, they're, they're so deep in debt. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being indebted. I mean, all over the world, governments keep borrowing. But in certain cases, where does the money go? You don't see infrastructure, you don't see good health care, you don't see education. Everything seriously is at a standstill. And just like um, uh, Shagun said, you, you're in court for so many things. At what point, or I mean, really, if Serap is a standalone agency and is doing all of this work and yet nothing has given, where do we come in? How do we support the likes of Serap, uh, the likes of um, um, budgets or EIE to get these governments to see that they need to be accountable and not just come up with ridiculous budgets and names and, of course, excessive office holders or political appointees 
uh, and then you, we don't see or feel good governance in any way. Uh, thank you. And that's why we are having this discussion. This discussion is part of that uh, much needed advocacy that we need to do to drive that public, uh, public consciousness and, and put it, keep it in the front burner of public discourse uh, to make sure that we understand in the, how these things of us. Really, we don't need an economic to break down the figure for us. We see it all around. The, 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 the deficit in infrastructure, roads, water, power, and, and, and COVID-19 got out the work of people to see our more about the health sector. And so we're doing this to be part of what we should do as citizens. And that's what you're doing to as, 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 as part of the media. But most important, we need to hold our leaders responsible within the confines of the law, which is why we file all those suits that we file. Because it, it's these things they do, it's not in the absence of a legal framework or a law that compels them to do what is right or prevents them from doing what is wrong. No, we have laws as it, as it were. It is just that uh, absence of political will. And like Mr. Shekhar has said, they just don't care. And that is where we have to persist in what we are doing. And for instance, I would have expected a candidate kind of state government, government, or all the governors and that, to make proactive disclosures of their budgetary allocations and expenditures, which is what the Freedom of Information Act mandates them to do. But we've not even seen that leadership test at the highest level from the president. So, of course, so it's not surprising. And so, so when we see uh, acts of populism like, like this, uh, uh, some people may take it as uh, some sort of movement. Yes, it's movement, nonetheless. But it, it, it would appear to be uh, two steps forward and then uh, ten steps uh, backward. So we need to consistently engage. Mm -hmm. And I, I will be interested, for instance, in knowing how much has been paid out under the candlestick pension laws to governors and deputy governors, and who has gotten when and how? And that is in the face of the of the, of the judgment that Sarah got in 2019 uh, from the Federal Court in Lagos, which mandated the Attorney General of Federation to take steps to challenge the legality of the various state pension laws and even seek for a recovery of the monies that have been paid out. And you'll get as good as mine how much these sums of monies are. They amount to billions of dollars all across the state. So you can imagine putting this as well into education as a power. And the various infrastructure that is just non existent, it would go a long way. And until the people understand, understand really the threats to our collective well being in this wasteful, uh, this spend trip nature, I doubt it will really engage as much as we, we should with our political office holders. Shegu, um, he's talking about engagement. How how, how much awareness is out there for the people to understand that they have rights? This is what question you should be asking. This is what your demand should be. We are very quick to say we need to place a demand on governments. We need to ask questions. But how many of us even know what questions to ask or where to even start? Again, there are people who have blamed our judicial system as, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we've not been able to get ahead. But then the politician is also part of the problem. If our politicians know how to cut corners around uh, the legalities that uh, one way or the, or the other could hold them to ransom, why are we having this conversation? Will we ever be able to surmount this problem? I mean, even in the nearest future, if the people who are supposed to even make or create better laws to help us are also politicians who sit at the floor of the National Assembly. Why would you want to cut your nose off yeah. to spite your face? It's a, you know, I mean, look, this, that's why I said when we started at this conversation, sometimes you look at this scenario and you almost begin to get despondent. Um, you almost begin to um, sink into despair because you're looking for a way out and, and it, it looks very difficult. Um, the only thing is that we know we will not give up. We're going to keep doing it because this is all we know to do. Um, we will have to continue to engage and continue to push for accountability and all of that. Now, um, to answer your question, um, so basically what, what needs to happen is uh, we need to continue to educate. You know, there is no other way. Like I always say, um, good governance is completely impossible without active citizen engagement. It's completely impossible. What guarantees good governance anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, it's the active and engaged citizen that is placing demands on his government consistently and insistently, right? So 
we need to push ourselves in that direction as a country. And the onus, you know, to get that done lies on civil society and the fourth estate of the realm, which is the press, right? So we need to continue to push for education and awareness about political um, um, responsibility and engagement on the part of citizens. We need to push information out there. We need to make platforms available for people to report things. We need to ensure that this freedom of information um, act that our political office holders are fighting tooth and nail against um, begin to uh, uh, get more and more um, um, attention and focus and implementation across all the states. We just have to keep going because there is no other way. The only way to get good governance is active citizen engagement. So, okay. and to get engagement, you need education, you need awareness. So, um, organizations like you know, like mine, like Serap, like um, um, e EI, EI, enough is enough, you know, and and all the others must join hands to to see where and how we can put together large, massive enlightenment campaigns okay. that will um, um, arm citizens with the knowledge that they require to right. ask the questions that need to be asked, to well, say the things to that go. need to be said. Right. Well, we have to go. Thank you very much. Um, Shegu Shopita is a good governance advocate, and of course, Kolawole Uluwadare is of Serap. Thank you, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. All right, well, that's it on Plus Politics. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Mariana Cohn.